Well, um, it, it's really very important to, to discuss chaos, and I was very glad that, that Carolyn chose that um, topic, because um, and especially the way it's being done, that it's being presented from the spiritual, from the astrological, and now from the scientific, to bring it together, it's very important because any kind of work like what you're doing, which is very empowering work, uh, has a, a downside which uh, creates a certain amount of vulnerabilities in a new dimension that you're working, and that vulnerability can affect the immune system, and that's why a lot of people sometimes don't feel well when they do some of these uh, uh, workshops, and uh, sometimes they get sick, <clears throat> and it's just that you're inviting chaos into your life, but the thing about it is that chaos is actually all over. The, the universe is chaotic, and I'll explain what, what it is in, in science, but we take chunks with our brains, because our brains are linear to a certain degree. We take chunks of reality, we make them linear, and we think that the world is linear, but the world is not. The world is totally chaotic. And when we find, when we go into these portals that I call portals, then you connect with chaos and you think, oh, synchronicity. But synchronicity is constantly happening because of the interconnectedness of the world. So chaos theory was uh, actually discovered <clears throat> in, in the 50s. Lorenz was a, um, a meteorologist and he was studying the weather and he was studying patterns of the weather with um, computer models because it's so complex. And he um, <clears throat> made a slight change and he wasn't even thinking about it. He made a slight change in the computer program and went to have some coffee and came back and he found this a tremendous difference in the outcome of what he had done. And he thought that it was computer problems and he thought it was all kinds of things. So finally, he was able to see that there was something going on, very unusual, in weather patterns uh, that he called chaos, which is what he called something that's very sensitive to initial conditions. So in chaos, something that happened, for example, a panic attack, you would think when a person has a panic attack, and if you've had them, you know they're, they're terrible, <clears throat> uh, you would think that something happening, is happening that day that, that triggered the panic attack, and it, and it didn't. There was something that started very sensitive conditions three months ago, two weeks ago, and then it blossoms or it, it, it spills into a, a panic attack. So the first concept of chaos is what, to see the interconnectedness in, in things, is um, Lorenz called it the butterfly effect. And the butterfly effect uh, is an analogy to show the interconnectedness of the world. And he's, he talked about, um, uh, he and others that actually that, that named it um, the butterfly effect, that if a butterfly flaps its wings in the, in the Amazon, and the flapping of the wings causes a little pollen to, to come off a, a flower, and it makes an oxen sneeze, and the sneeze moves and goes on and on and on, then two weeks later, you might have a sandstorm in the, in the Sahara, the interconnectedness of the world. That's a butterfly effect. And you'll see as I move on with this how we can then apply it to your journey, the, the chaotic uh, process. Now, before that, the, the chaos and randomness were seen uh, interchangeably, and they're very different. Random is something that has zero predictability, zero order, uh, any zero, it has no way of being able to see any kind of pattern. That's random. And there's very little randomness in the world, by the way. Chaos is something different. Chaos is unpredictable. Uh, it, it's, it's a disordered order, it's the best way to put it, disordered order. But it has its patterns that cannot be predicted with Euclidean geometry, like, like squares and, and, and triangles. It doesn't work. So, for example, a cloud is a chaotic process. You can't use Euclidean geometry to predict the movement of a cloud or, or the form of a cloud because it's, it has a chaotic process and it doesn't fit our linear world. And chaos has its own geometry called fractal geometry. And fractal geometry, <clears throat> what it does is it, it shows, for example, how clouds grow. And any chaotic process has what's called in infinite nesting, which means that it, it replicates itself and replicates itself. The, the nervous system is a chaotic process, the way the, the, the uh, nerve pathways work. Um, the roots of a tree are chaotic because they have infinite nesting. You notice that the roots don't grow a root here and a house there. It's, it's always a pattern of reproducing itself not in a linear predictable way, but in a way that you know that if it's a fractal, the fractal will reproduce itself in fractals and fractals and fractals infinitely. So it has a built-in system that reproduces itself, and that's why it's called infinite nesting. And although these words are technical and everything, you'll see how bring them down to earth so it'll make sense when you're having coffee or you know something really powerful. <clears throat> uh, and uh, then the other thing is that if I take water, 
for example, and I spill it on something, on, on, a, on a very uh, smooth surface, the water doesn't go all over the place. The water has a chaotic pattern, but it's contained by something that actually holds the water from go going all over the place. And that something is a variety of things that are going on at the same time. See, it's not linear. It's the, uh, the uh, temperature, the angle, uh, the smoothness, and all those things are the containers of chaos. So chaos has containment, but it has a containment that's not linear. So you take water sometime and spill it, and you'll see that it has a pattern. And those patterns are the ones that, uh, that chaos is contained under. And you'll see how we'll be able to apply how to contain your chaos. Uh, and so what you're doing is creating a new language so that you can have a new navigational chart. So when you go into chaos, you know that you cannot use the navigational chart of linear. I was um, yesterday with a group that I was um, having lunch with, gave the analogy that, that if you go from linear to chaos without changing to chaos, it's like walking around Chicago with a map of New York and looking at and see, trying to figure it out. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it has no correlation. Uh, so you have to learn then to shift to see when it's linear and when it's chaotic and then go from one navigational chart to another. One of the reasons is that, of course, that so you can find your way, but another reason is that if you don't, you maintain a chronic um, fight or flight alarm system because you're trying to rep, you're trying to um, validate something that's not that you can't validate. So the nervous system sees it as something that that is uh, out of tune with with linear, and it creates a chaotic a, uh, a not chaotic but a fight or flight state, which then secretes cortisols, which are the the uh, stress hormones, and suppresses immune function. So imagine if you're walking around without the shifting of maps, as if, if you have 10 chaotic events a day, the amount of cortisol that you're secreting and the, and the hyper alarm that you create in your life. And eventually that breaks down tissue and, and causes illness because you're predisposed to illnesses, but, but it's a very 15%, it's really genetic. Everything else is cultural, I think, and, and mindsets and belief systems. So um, these containers are called strange attractors. So you see, it sounds almost mystical, and it's really very, very good science. So the strange attractors are the ones that maintain the chaos, and you'll see how you can begin to identify strange attractors when you go into chaos. But it's important to have the language to be able to then plug in the map. Um, the other important thing about chaos is that it, if you resist it, the, the rules of chaos, if you resist it, it goes up, the, the turbulence goes up. If uh, a river is chaotic, and if you, if you throw a big stone in the middle of the river to stop it, what it does is it grows, grows, grows turbulence, and then it bifurcates. And that's how chaos works. If you put up any kind of resistance, there's turbulence, turbulence, and then it bifurcates and the chaos continues. So you want to go into chaos to diminish the, the, the amount of time you're going to be in chaos. Um, I used to go to Rio to surf, and they tell you that there's some undercurrents that if you go, I mean, it could be knee deep, and those undercurrents can just pull you off, and you end up uh, half a block out. That's a chaotic process. If you fight it, most likely you'll drown. So what you have to do is you have to go with the chaotic process, and eventually it bifurcates, and, and, it, go, and it brings you back. The good news is that bifurcations always end in, in linear processes. When, when there's a linear process that goes chaotic, eventually it comes back to linear. This is why when you look at the weather, when you look at uh, out, um, forecasts, they only give you seven days. The reason they give you seven days is because the weather becomes chaotic on the seventh day and no computer can, can uh, predict it. So it's not because they're trying to be nice with you. <laughs> they, can't, they can't figure it out. It gets chaotic on the seventh. And so they can only go up seven days. But when it goes chaotic, then there, there's a different chart, the different navigational uh, map that you follow. So what I try to do with chaos is to bring psychonormenology and what we know about chaos and to diminish the um, uh, fight or flight condition that you're into when you shift from one to the other. And the neurological and neuropsychological processes are different when you're trying to validate as when you're trying to in, go into a chaotic state. And you'll see in a minute how it comes together. But it's very important to see that, that 
when you're from linear to, to chaotic, it's not just something that you're imagining or thinking or, or feeling. Your whole nervous system, your whole mind, mind, body, spirit is also in a chaotic state. And you have physiological consequences for that. Because we're, our temple is biological, whether we want it or not. Uh, in, in L.A., everyone thinks that they're evolved and they walk uh, two feet above the, the, the ground, but it's a pseudo evolvement You know, you're still biological. <laughs> and that's why they have such problems with exchange of beauty for power. It's a real... I, I told a friend that I wanted to do a workshop on that, and he said, don't, because nobody's going to come. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all you have, you know. But, so... Um, <laughs> So, as you begin to see that there, there are two styles, and, and, that, that, and that chaos is not random, that chaos has predictability, but it's a nonlinear predictability, then you learn to navigate. And one of the things that needs to happen in order to le let your nervous system and your endocrine system and your um, immune system know that, that it's okay, that, that this is not a novel event of, of danger, is that in a linear world, what we try to do is we try to predict. If I get up in the morning and I turn the key, the car will go on. That's predictability. When you go into chaos, what we try to do is we try to continue to predict and validate, and you can't. So when you try to predict and validate, you're creating turbulence, which, br which brings up your, your, your nervousness, your um, cortisols, and everything happening, because it's saying something doesn't make sense here, and my tools don't work. And what you have to do then is go from predictability to discovery. And that's when you begin to trick the nervous system into being okay. Because discovery has a, a different psychoneurological uh, process than, than validation. So if you try to validate that that wall is not solid, it's going to be real hard. Because you're going to be bumping your head over and over and over. And your nervous system will be responding to the, the, the problem that you're creating instead of saying, okay, solid what can I discover about the solidness of this rather than how can I go through the solidness and that's what we try to do when we don't shift gears